Hey, model engineers, my name is Doug, and welcome to the Full Earth Workshop. What's your name? My name's Landon. And I'm Landon. My name's Landon. Hey, man, <laughs> we're cooking up a really cool to me a model kit, but first we're going to find out a little bit about the Panzer II. You ready? Oh, yeah. What's going on? This is Doug for the Full Earth Workshop. Today we're talking about German tank technology. By the end of World War I, armored vehicles such as tanks had really proven themselves to be able to blast through the line of defense, and militaries all around the world began developing and producing tanks. Except for Germany. The Germans not only had to pay reparations, they also were not allowed to develop military technology such as tanks. The German military was forced to train their fighting men in vehicles like these made of rubber and tin. But that was about to change when Chancellor Hitler became more and more powerful. He also had plans for his country to do the same. The Third Reich was able to hide their development of military vehicles by calling them agricultural vehicles. And the Panzer I really looked the part. It was just able to carry a machine gun with very light armor. As the Panzer II began development, the prevailing thought in the military is that it would be an accompanying vehicle to the advancing artillery as they crashed through enemy's defensive lines. Panzer IIs were also very active in Operation Barbarossa, but as time went on, the competitors were getting much better. The Russian T-34 turned out to be a deadly adversary. Later improvements to the Panzer II, such as torsion bar suspension, really helped the off-road capability of this tank, but the 14.5 mm armor turned out to be deadly for the crews. With armor this thin, it was only good for fending off small arms fire. Most armor enthusiasts have heard of the 88 mm Rhine metal cannon that Tiger I used in 1943. But it's rather surprising that in 1940, the Panzer II had a 20 mm auto cannon based on the Flak 30 anti-aircraft gun and it was totally ineffective against Allied tanks. A 37 mm cannon upgrade was considered, but it was also considered too late, so they had to make do with tungsten cord solid ammunition. The engine stayed the same for all the Panzer II variants. It was the Maybach HL62 DRM. It was a petrol engine at about 138 horsepower. The Panzer II served the Germans very well during the first few Blitzkrieg years, but as the men tired out, so did the tank. By 1940, it was relegated to just training the new crews for the upcoming Panzer III and IV. Less than 2,000 Panzer IIs were built during World War II, but because they were sent behind friendly lines for training purposes, many have survived. You might even be able to inspect one near you. Now, there is one near to where I live. It's the U.S. Army Armor Cavalry Collection. It's located at the National Infantry Museum in Fort Benning, Georgia, and it's a great museum. Many of the vehicles from the old museum in Fort Knox were brought here. It features one of only seven Tiger I tanks that still exist. Here on the right, you see the two centimeter auto cannon, which fired about 600 rounds per minute. And on the left is the really cool MG-34, which is widely considered the world's first general purpose machine gun. Notice that the Panzer II did not have the interleaving wheels that most of the vehicles for the rest of the war would have. That wheel configuration gave really good weight distribution, but also added some other unexpected problems. Those were seen on the Tiger 1 and 2, the Panther, and even the tracked motorcycle, the Kettenkrad. The lessons learned with the Panzer II would serve the Germans well. They would use this experience to build the amazing tanks that hit the battlefield beginning in 1943. Hey Landon, I see you've been busy again with the airbrush. What are we looking at here today? This model here is a Panzer II from Tamiya, and I modeled it with colors from the Africa Corps during the early portions of the war. You know what's amazing is this is only about, what, three and a half to four inches across. So keep that in mind as we start to describe what's going on here. Look at those uh, scratching effects, amazing. Thank you, yeah, so this is actually in 135 scale. The model itself is actually pretty small. You can kind of see that I worked quite a bit on perfecting the chipping fluids uh, that you can get from Vallejo and MIG uh, and use them to create some pretty accurate chipping effects. With this model, I was trying to show that this tank had been maybe used in Italy and then 
been brought over to Africa and repainted in a desert yellow color. And so I thought maybe you could see some of the German gray colors that had chipped that could be seen through the chips of the desert color. It kind of turned out pretty well. Man, I love what you did with the gun here. That looks more metal. That's really metal, isn't it? No, it's not actually metal. It's all plastic. So what I did there is figured that maybe when they were painting the tank that they painted over the gun and that the gun's heat would cause the paint to chip off. Very cool. Is that realistic? I don't know, but I think it's kind of cool looking. So with every new model, I try to experiment with new techniques that I've read about or seen on YouTube. With this model, I began working with oil paints and creating my own washes. I had some old bottles from Tamiya that I used all the paint from, so I used those as kind of vessels to carry this new collection of different washes. A lot of the white and and kind of reddish colors you see are all from these new washes that I've created. I've used enamel thinner from Tamiya to thin them down to the point where they can be used as filters and washes. And I think the result is pretty cool. Normally I use dry pigments, uh, which you can get from pastels or you can buy them already mixed for you for the pigments. Tell me a little bit about the torsion suspension that was just added to this tank in one of the later variants right the torsion bars are really pretty modern if you think about it tanks nowadays still use them originally with some of the older suspension systems they either took up way too much space or they lessened the the smoothness of the ride to the point where they weren't super effective uh, being used on tanks and torsion bars were kind of a breakthrough with how to support massive amounts of weights while keeping the tank somewhat light One cool thing about this model is that this is actually the first model I've ever made that I painted. When I was younger, I made models, and I didn't really know how to paint things yet, so I just had them uh, unpainted on the shelf. And so this one looked kind of crappy, so I figured, hey, you know what, I'll repaint this thing. And that just kind of shows how, you know, hey, if you feel like you haven't done the best job in a model, you can just start over. Yeah, go back. Hey, so would you recommend this Tamiya model to other modelers? Absolutely. I pretty much would recommend anything Tamiya makes. Yeah, thank you so much for being with us, Landon. See you soon. Thank you. Well, the next part is up to you. Will you like this video? Will you subscribe? And will you ring the bell? I hope so. See you next week.